people ask me like what I do for a living, uh, I, I used to say I look for aliens, but then they get like ET in their head. Uh, now I say I look for ways to look for aliens, which is much closer to the truth. And actually what I do is I, I, these days I sit at the interface between scientists like yourselves that try to think of what measurements we would need to make to look for life on an exoplanet, a planet around another star, and the engineers that we have at NASA Goddard that build giant space telescopes. And so most of my talk today is going to be talking about the science that that telescope, this particular one, Louvoir, could do. And by the way, that stands for Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared Telescope. It will change its name again, like at least once or twice if it actually happens. But that's kind of like the stand-in name. Uh, we do the boring names first, and then we name it after someone like when it gets closer to launch. So who knows who that one will be named after. We'll find out hopefully one day. Um, so I'm going to start with the science, and then I'll get to the telescope that's going to make the science happen. And I'd like to call Louvoir the Astrobiology Telescope. That's not an official thing. That's just my thing. And the reason is, uh, and there's a, a broader set of questions that astrobiologists look at, like with regards to prebiotic chemistry and the origins of life, as we were hearing about today. But there's three critical questions to astrobiology that Louvoir is going to address. It's going to address where did life come from? What is the diversity of worlds, especially the, 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 the diversity of worlds beyond our solar system? And how can that put our solar system into context? And is there life beyond Earth? So I'm just going to go through these one by one and, and kind of outline the, the types of science we can do with the space telescope that address these questions. So first, where did life come from? You know, obviously we're not going to be doing chemistry in the lab. However, as Jill Tarter would have told us, that we're basically the, the, the logical extension of hydrogen and helium evolving for so long that it begins to ask where it came from. Um, or as, as Carl Sagan said it, uh, before, you, if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, first you have to invent the universe. Right? And you have to invent all the things that go into that apple pie. And what LUVAR, or a space telescope, can do here is it can actually start to probe the processes that led to the formation of elements that eventually get incorporated into the planets like Earth that, that, that living things can, can be, exist on. So here's Andromeda, one of our nearby galaxies. Hubble has been able to resolve individual stars in Andromeda, and it's been able to do that throughout the uh, main sequence of stars, which helps us understand uh, the main sequence evolution of, of stars. Now, what a telescope, a larger telescope, so Hubble can do that for very, very close galaxies, and the way to think about it is the bigger your telescope, the greater your angular resolution. You can see sort of closer thing, things that are closer to each other you can separate out in your, in your optical array. So Hubble can see uh, individual stars in our, in our nearest part of our galactic neighborhood, the near, most nearby galaxies. Louvoir would extend that out uh, for, for multiple megaparsecs. And, and that's important for a number of reasons. One is it gets us just a larger sample set of galaxies to do this individual star probing on. But the second is as that sample size goes up, the diversity of galaxies goes up. And, and in any physical system, having being able to probe a, a wider diversity of targets is always going to be a good thing. And that's that's a topic I'll come back to again and again, is a sort of a diversity of targets that we want to be able to look at as astronomers when we're thinking about any physical process. Uh, in particular, what we're interested in is being able to not just get at dwarf, uh, dwarf and large spiral galaxies, but also large elliptical galaxies. Uh, another way to demonstrate this is this is a, by the way, for the non-astronomers, like z equals two, if you ever see these z numbers, it just means how redshifted it is, and the larger that z number is, the further away the galaxy would be. Um, so this would be like a low mass galaxy at a z equals 2 redshift with Hubble. Okay, so to show you what Louvoir would do for a similar galaxy, so this is pretty far away. Um, this is what Louvoir would see. So not only are you blowing this up on the screen and making, you know, a bigger target to look at, you're getting more spatial resolution. Like the other nickname for this telescope before the Louvoir study had happened was called the High Definition Space Telescope. Because the difference in pixels that we have between Hubble and Louvoir is comparable to the difference between a high definition and standard definition television. And this isn't just about the pretty pictures, although these are pretty awesome. It's also about probing the physical and chemical processes happening in these stellar environments. And, and this is where the ultraviolet, the OUV in Louvoir comes in. Um, because if you can probe these stars into the ultraviolet, or probe stars into the ultraviolet, um, you can actually start to look at their elemental compositions. Um, <clears throat> and you can do everything from oxygen to magnesium all the way down through uh, carbon and, and sulfur and, and iron down here. Um, and and that, that's starting to get at the processes that make the elements that we are made of, that Earth is made of, and that other planets are made of. And being able, again, to do this for a diversity of, of stellar targets and a diverse, diversity of galactic environments, right? We, we talk today a lot, a lot about how the environment of a chemical system is important, right? Well, that, the same thing is true for stars, but for stars, the, the environment is something on the galactic scale. 
And that also becomes important when you think about cycling of matter between and amongst uh, a galaxy. One thing that's, that's um, kind of, well, at least to me, I, I, should, I shouldn't say it's at the forefront. It's, a, it's at my forefront of knowledge. <laughs> I, and I didn't know any of the stuff I've talked about uh, up through now before the Louvoir study started, because I'm an exoplanet scientist. Um, but one thing I've learned is that we now understand that matter actually can cycle beyond a galaxy and then flow back into it. And it's actually that cycling that helps feed uh, future star formation. Um, the analogy for me as an Earth scientist is it's a little bit like plate tectonics, um, overturning nutrients and refreshing nutrients to a, to a biosphere. You need um, the capability for elements to be able to be cycled past a galaxy and flow back into it. Now, the way you probe that is you'll actually look for background high energy stars that puncture the galaxy and let you, uh, because they're kind of like beacons shining through the galaxy, you use them as a background light source. And then, and then with that background light source, you can um, assess the composition of the galaxy in various points and get it, how much mass is there and also what it's made of. Um, now, it, as you go to larger and larger telescopes, you can see fainter and fainter background beacons. And that means you get more and more background beacons. And that means that if there's some um, non-consistent shape to a galaxy and that extra galactic flow, like we think there might be, this is sort of an artist's rendering. If you just have two points, you can't really say much about this two-dimensional structure here. But if you've got an array of points, which is what a larger aperture telescope will allow, because it's seeing the fainter stuff, um, then you can probe more things. So this is sort of the... The second thing you gain when you go to larger telescopes, right? You get better angular resolution, better spatial resolution, but you also can uh, see fainter targets that are either further away, or in this case, more faint targets within a particular field. Okay, and then it's not just about the stars forming and what, what, how elements are cycled within the stars. We good? Okay. Uh, it's also about how that matter gets incorporated eventually into planets themselves. And this is another thing LUFAR will be doing. It's going to be looking at the debris disks around stars, um, especially younger, for this science case at least, especially younger planetary systems where there's still a lot of gas and dust in the system. One, <clears throat> one way I like looking at this is this is the Beta Pictoris di uh, disk, which is really famous because it's got this cool structure. Um, and, then, and what we did was first we saw the, the, the disk, which extends really far out into this, this planetary system. And then we saw a planet here at two different uh, parts of its orbit with another uh, uh, observation. This zoom in is what Louvoir will be able to do. It'll be able to go further into the interior of the system and do two things. One, look for planets in, in here closer to the star, but second, look at the dust and gas closer to the star as well. And so we'll be able to track not just what this big picture uh, uh, disk looks like, but also what the stuff closer into the star looks like where habitable planets are forming. So we'd be able, we, we know a lot now today as astronomers about how planets form, especially further out from the star. But if you want to know what's happening close to the star where, where habitable planets form, you actually need to get um, a, a different kind of telescope that can see closer to the star. And that's one of the things Louvoir would enable. And, and we're going to do stuff like this close uh, in, in our own solar system as well, closer to home. So this is a, a giant <laughs> scatter plot of all the solar system small bodies that Louvoir will also be able to probe for its chemical composition. Yeah, and I didn't mention this, we're also going to be doing chemical analyses of these. So almost every target we look at, there's going to be a spectrometer on board that's going to look at the, the composition of all our targets, whether it's stars or the debris disks, and in this case, small bodies in our solar system. So here's Pluto. We wouldn't just be able to see Pluto, we'd actually be able to characterize its atmosphere. Um, I'm going to show a picture of how impressive our, our Pluto observations would be in a, in a moment. For smaller bodies like Sedna, um, we'd also be able to look at their, their sort of temporal and spatial variability and take multiple snapshots of the thing as it rotates or goes through seasons. Um, and then for really small stuff, we could search at least for the objects themselves, even if we can't sort of probe their, their chemical composition. So this is Pluto with Hubble. This is what Pluto would look like with a 15 meter loop bar. You don't get the cute heart that we got with the flyby mission, right? You can't quite make out that level of spatial detail. But what you can do is you can tell that something is going on here, right? I mean, part of the thing that was amazing about the New Horizons spacecraft when it, when it passed by Pluto is I actually remember I got, a, I got a letter like three months before the flyby, or maybe it was a lot, maybe six months before the flyby from a, a grade school kid who said, like, do you think there could be life on Pluto? And like, you know, skeptical, we're trained to be skeptical scientists, right? So I was like, no, Pluto's like a dumb, boring ball of like rock and ice and it's dead and nothing's happening there. And then I stopped because it was a great schooler that I was going to reply to. And I was like, okay, let's, 
let's try to be a little more optimistic. And I, and I thought about it for a while, and I was like, what's the optimis optimistic take here? And I was like, well, we've seen a lot of water activity on places we never expected it before. We actually haven't seen Pluto in detail before. Um, maybe there is some geological or subsurface kind of activity on Pluto, and if there is, then you know maybe there's a chance for life. And the way we'll know as scientists is we'll do a test, and it just so happens that in a few months from now we're going to have a test when this spacecraft flies by Pluto. And sure enough, like we flew by, and <laughs> Pluto is definitely geologically active. There's like flows and like these huge flat areas that are uh, some sort of like lake bed, and like. First of all, the kid was right. <laughs> Second of all, like, I mean, I don't know if there's life on Pluto, but like the kid was right that like I shouldn't have just dismissed it right away. But this is the kind of thing you can do when you get imagery of targets, you know. Um, and we'll be able to get to, uh, imagery at least this good for anything closer than Pluto, which is basically the rest of the solar system. Um, so this is the kind of stuff we can do. Okay, so this is moving closer to my uh, sort of scientific wheelhouse, although not quite there yet. A second question that astrobiologists ask that Louvoir can help address is what is the diversity of worlds? Um, and I, uh, I love this quote. The very nature of science is discoveries, and the best of those discoveries are the ones you don't expect uh, from Neil deGrasse Tyson. <clears throat> and the reason I put this quote up is because the history of exoplanet science has basically been a story of, a, of repeated uh, 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 upending of our expectations. Here's the world in our solar system. This is, and by the way, if you ask me, Pluto still is a planet. I mean, look at this thing. How can this not be a planet, right? Someone said, like, it has to pass the Captain Kirk test, which is like, does it look like if, if the Enterprise or whatever came up on the planet, would you say it's a planet? And I don't think anyone would say that this is not a planet. Um, but that's a different talk. Okay, so th these worlds, and including the history in particular of Earth and of Mars, um, and to some degree Venus, um, that's what a lot of our expectations were based on. I, I was saying on the bus on the way over here, we had this image of peas and carrots being well separated in planetary systems. You had small planets close in and gas giants further away, and the two shall not ever mix, right? And what we ended up with was more like some like uh, toddler's smoothie or baby smoothie of like mixed vegetables and fruits and ice and everything, kind of and yogurt, um, all blended together. Like you can get almost any kind of system out um, if you have the right starting conditions. Um, the very first exoplanet we found, uh, Pegasus uh, 51 Peg B, was a planet we didn't know as a planet at first because it was so different from our expectations. It was a planet bigger than Jupiter, but closer to the star than Mercury is to the sun. That you, you literally couldn't make that planet in our models um, when, when we discovered it. Uh, we found the, the most common kind of planet are these things called super-Earths or sub-Neptunes that are bigger than Earth but smaller than Neptune. We expected there to be sort of a desert in that part of parameter space, and it, based on our formation models, it ended up being the most common kind of planet out there. And these kinds of discoveries, they're not just like, oh, it's cool because it like, wasn't what we expected. They end up influencing the way we think about our home system, right? So if you, if you ask the question today, how did Mars form and get the size and the orbit that it, it has now, you get a different answer because our models are now better because they've been validated against a greater diversity of targets, right? Because we know hot Jupiters exist and super Earths exist, our models had to improve to recreate those planets. And once we did that, we were actually able to better recreate the formation of Mars in its current state. So that's cool, right? That means like our understanding of home has improved by our looking at stuff in the stars. And then my favorite is Kepler 16b. So Kepler-16b is a planet, and there's, it's not the only one we found that is uh, orbiting a binary star. So this is like, oh, I'm gonna, kind of hard to do this with. All right, so like you get two stars at like the center of the system, and they're orbiting each other, and then you get like an, a planet orbiting the two stars further out. And if you were standing on the surface of that planet, you could see like a double sunset, right? Because the planet's out here, and so both the both the stars are setting at the same time. And that's like really cool. But again, no one expected this to happen. Uh, I'll, the joke I like to tell is, is that, you know, some people expected it to happen, but they were looking at a different source <laughs> literature. Um, because, and, and, you know, I'm joking a bit, but like sometimes we have to allow our imaginations to run wild a little bit to see what's possible out there um, and not be too constrained by, by the things we think are, are permissible just, you know, by our finely tuned models that recreate the reality that we're living in. But all the discoveries we have, and by the way, this is now what's called like the Kepler orrery. So this is all the planets that the Kepler telescope has found, or it actually had found as of, I think, 2013 or something like that. So there's thousands of worlds, literally thousands of worlds we found beyond our solar system. <clears throat> the ones Kepler has found, which number in the thousands, 
by the way, it, it all happens like in a, a, a patch of sky that's like the palm of your hand outstretched. So, you know, if you go out into the night sky, even if you're in Atlanta or like me in DC and you can't see the, the stars too well, you can do some astronomy. Just put your hand up there and know that there's thousands of planets hiding behind it. Um, and, or if you can count the stars, we now know that on average, there is a planet for every star. On average, there is a planet that's in the habitable zone in Rocky, so a potentially habitable world around one, ever, for, uh, one of those planets for every 10 stars. So if you, if you can even just see like 10 stars in the Atlanta night sky, you found 10 planets too. And you've probably found one planet that has conditions that could allow for life. I couldn't make any of those statements 10 years ago and have any degree of scientific credibility. It was actually a totally unconstrained problem. And now it's actually quite well constrained. We might argue about the, the, how abundant the, the potentially habitable worlds are, but the argument isn't between, you know, you have to count 10 stars or a thousand stars. The argument is like, do you have to count like five stars or do you have to count 10 or do you have to count 20? That's, you know, a factor of two is like the, the range that we're talking about for uncertainties now, not orders of magnitude, which is what it was before Kepler. Now, the other thing to point out here is that's all awesome. Everything I just talked about is like fascinating and cool and groundbreaking and, and it's totally changing the way we think about how planets form and evolve and has influenced how we think about our home system. But for the most part, it's all about the planet sizes. I, I, I say they're astrophysical properties, how big these planets are, in some cases how massive they are, and how, what their orbits are like, how, how far away they are from their host star, and how elliptical those orbits are. For the most part, that's all we know. We don't know much about their chemical composition. We certainly don't know much about whether or not they have life. And because of that, our, even if we talk about a habitable world or an Earth-like world, all we're really saying is that we can't rule out the possibility that it has liquid water oceans. And that's about all we can, and even that's a model result. It's not something we've actually measured. Okay, so this is where Louvoir comes in. Because it's gonna actually take pictures of these worlds. It's not gonna get like spatial resolution like I was showing for Pluto, but it's gonna turn each, not the specific worlds that Kepler found, but it's gonna, four planets around other stars, get pictures of them. They're each gonna be sort of one point of light on, on the detectors, so that the telescope's just gonna see a point of light for each planet. But it's gonna do this for hundreds of worlds. And that hundreds of worlds is gonna have a tremendous diversity to it uh, in a number of ways. We're gonna look at different size targets from things that are like Mars sized all the way up to uh, gas giant Jupiter sized. We're gonna see planets that are really hot, like too close to the sun to have life regardless of their size, and really cold that are way too far away to, to maintain life, and well, at least global life that we could detect with the telescope. No offense, you're open, if I say the habitable zone, I'm not like dissing you or saying life can't be there, because I think it can. Um, and we're gonna look at like planets around a diversity of stellar targets. So like we live around a G star, we're gonna look around A and F stars, which are, much, which are hotter than the sun, and K stars and M stars, which are cooler than the sun. The M stars are particularly wild, like they have like all this high energy radiation, uh, they could have tidally locked orbits where the same side of the planet is always facing the star. M stars are like, they're like a modeler's paradise right now because like all these different things change when you grow around these M stars, um, just enough to like get you funding to do modeling research. Um, and they're the first things we're gonna be able to probe, not with LUVAR, but with uh, ground-based telescopes in the next decade and pretty soon with the James Webb Space Telescope as well. I'm not gonna talk about that too much tonight, but if you hear about M stars, that's why they're like really in vogue right now. Okay, uh, but we're also gonna look at not just the M's, but the K's and the G's and the A's and F's too, which is awesome because diversity is good when we're looking at uh, physical systems. Okay, and not, we're not just gonna see these things, and this is, this is something actually the James Webb Space Telescope and uh, extremely large telescopes on the ground are gonna start to revolutionize. Uh, you might have heard of a European mission that was just selected a week or two ago called Ariel. It also is gonna be doing this sort of thing. The, 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 the pivot point is we're gonna move beyond just astrophysical characterization and start to move into chemical characterization. So if you wanna look at a chemical system in the solar system, um, ideally you'd like have something like a mass spectrometer that can like count the you know, mass units that you have from a particular molecule or something like that. You take a lab to the field when you can, and if you can't, you bring your samples back. That's even better, because then you have all your, your lab equipment you know, coming to the fore. For all these exoplanets, we're not gonna be able to do that. We're not gonna be able to bring samples back. We're not, at least, uh, I'm not counting on us being able to land stuff in, in these planets and like do chemical analyses in situ. So all our chemical analyses have to be remote. The way we do that is we take spectra. So this is just, I'm gonna show a lot of spectra the rest of this, this talk, that's gonna be like my main plotting device here. 
And they're all just basically how many photons or how much energy you get from the star as a function of wavelength. Uh, and for Louvoir, because it's the large UV optical infrared telescope, this, uh, all these plots are going to, they should mostly, if not all, run from the ultraviolet through the near infrared. So there's visible wavelengths that we can see with our eyes, but also ultraviolet that are bluer than what we can see, and then the infrared stuff, which is redder, that we can see. Now this is powerful for a number of reasons, but probably the most important of which is certain molecules absorb, uh, absorb certain wavelengths of light. And because of that, if we see dips in the spectrum, we know that there's that molecule in that atmosphere absorbing those wavelengths of light. So we can see if there's CO or CO2 or CH4. Uh, I like the carbon species, you can tell. You can see if there's water in a planetary atmosphere with this, with this technique and see if, uh, and that's both important for the habitable and the non-habitable worlds. Um, and when you put that stuff together, you can start to get at bigger picture questions than just what are the planets made of. Um, for example, we've got this theory of sort of, um, we're starting to build what's called like a family portrait of exoplanets with like different classes of planet. And one of the things that we think happens is as you get to larger mass, um, the composition shifts. So this is metallicity as, a, as an astronomer would define it. So this is like the, the stuff heavier than hydrogen and helium with regards to the host star. Like, so how enriched is this in carbon and oxygen and everything else that's on the second row or below on the periodic table? How enriched is the planet compared to the star as a function of planet mass? And there's this theory out there that looks at these sort of like really, these data points with really big error bars that's saying that there's a trend here. Now, I don't know if you believe that trend or not. I can squint and see it. Um, but what would be better is if we can make more measurements, which Louvar will do, and if we could have a smaller error pars, which Louvar will get for us. So if we were able to make measurements for a number of data points with this tighter error bar, we would be able to actually see if this was you know, some byproduct of <laughs> squinting and drawing a line through, through points with large error bars or whether or not it was something that was really happening in the universe. And by the way, there are a few small error bars on here. Those are the planets in our solar system. That's why the error bars are tight. And I, we will tie it back to the solar system as well. I love this image. So this is from the Juno spacecraft, which is around Jupiter right now. <clears throat> this is a picture both of, of Jupiter from Juno, in, so not in situ, but in orbit around Jupiter. It's also the same pixel resolution that Louvoir would get of Jupiter. So we wouldn't get exactly this sort of angle on the poles that Juno is getting for us, which is one of the reasons Juno's there. But we could get this, these kind of beautiful images of Jupiter at basically any time we want, whenever it's like in our field of view. Which is cool because it makes awesome pictures that we can share with the public. But it's also important because we'll be able to probe dynamical processes in Jupiter's atmosphere. And, and not just over the course of like, you know, weeks or a year or two, like our spacecraft normally lasts for when, we're, when they're at Jupiter, but maybe over multiple years. And if Louvoir lasts long enough, as Hubble has, maybe over decades and seasons, which would be really neat. Okay, so this is, this is now getting closer to my wheelhouse. Is there life beyond Earth? How, how long have I been up here? Can I get a time check? Okay, great. <clears throat> so is there life beyond Earth? This is the question that is most classically astrobiology, but I would argue all the stuff we heard this morning and this afternoon and all the stuff I've, I've talked about so far is also astrobiology. So is there life beyond Earth? What's Louvoir going to do there? Actually, this is the main thing Louvoir was designed to, to address. At least it's the, the toughest technical problem the engineers are dealing with. Well, I'll get to that at the end. I love this quote. So if, if people don't know who Nancy Grace Roman is, she was kind of like one of the pioneers that actually made Hubble a thing. And she's, she's just, in, especially in engineering and in space astronomy circles, she's like just universally regarded with just tremendous esteem. And I love this because I think this is so true for the field of astrobiology, and I think it's true for basically everything I'm about to talk about, which in our lifetime is going to move from the realm of modelers like myself to observational astronomy, or observational astronomers. I like to tell students that the jobs I took after my PhD were not in existence only a few years before. And for the kids here, you could do your PhD on the data we're talking about and get a job that doesn't exist today when you finish school. That's pretty cool. Okay, so. What Louvar is going to do here is it's going to do two things. One, it's going to use that chemical composition to look for signs of life. But it's also going to do that in a survey sense. You know, we could, there's, there's ideas out there, and I'm, I'll talk about this briefly at the end, for telescopes that would l assess the chemical composition of planets in the habitable zone, but only do that maybe one or a handful of times. Louvar is de being designed literally with the goal of doing this for at least 30 rocky planets in the habitable zones of other stars. 
Now, the reason we want to get to the number 30, we're actually designing the telescope to get to that goal, is if you, if you do the statistics, once you get to 30, you can assess the presence or absence of a particular uh, property to within 10%. And that you can, you can almost, as long as that property is something the telescope can observe and measure, it, it's any of the properties and all the properties. So I could say, I want to know whether rocky planets in the habitable zone, which is defined around this concept of having the possibility to harbor global water oceans. I want to know what percentage of planets in the habitable zone, rocky planets in the habitable zone, actually have water and actually have oceans. Right? Is it 100%? Is it 0%? Is it 50%? I don't know. The error bars right now are zero to 100%, right? Um, after Louvoir, it'll be some number plus or minus 10%. You could ask the same question about oxygen, potential biosignature, or methane, or organic haze. I mean, you could, anything Louvoir can observe, you can say, how abundant is that on planets inside the habitable zone? And if you believe we can look for life, you can not just look for life, but try to put an estimate on what atus of life is. How common is life on these planets that have global liquid water oceans? Now, how do we do that? We, again, do it through spectroscopy. And actually, we, in many ways, leverage things we've learned from here on Earth. This is a, a seasonal map from space of growth, both on the continents, shown here uh, with forests kind of growing and, and shrinking seasonally, and algal blooms in the ocean. We can observe this from space because there are certain pigments that observe, uh, absorb certain wavelengths of light. And because leaves also have sort of a reflective feature that is also wavelength dependent, we can observe from space. So not only can we probe chemical composition remotely, but we can also probe uh, the stuff that life is made of, and, and especially the stuff related to photosynthesis. And I love this. This is the carbon dioxide uh, in our atmosphere as observed by the OCO, the Observing Carbon, or the Orbiting Carbon Observatory, which, by the way, if you draw that out, it's a CO2 molecule. Awesome acronym. <clears throat> um, so this is CO2 coming out from various places on Earth, and like, there's, again, like a whole talk on this one slide if we wanted to stare at it for a while. Um, but the point here is we can probe carbon dioxide remotely. We know how to do it on Earth. The challenge is, both with the carbon dioxide and oxygen and water and methane and also the, the pigment stuff I was showing before, is how can you assess carbon dioxide when you don't get this spatial information, but you're just getting a single pixel of light from that, that planet? That's, that's one of the big challenges we have. Because, uh, you know, and Carl Sagan was really poetic about this, right? He talked about, like, you know, all of human history has happened on this one pale blue dot. Like, and that's awesome, unless you're a scientist trying to figure out and prove to your colleagues whether or not that pale blue dot has life or not, right? That's hard. And again, I, I mentioned this before, we're going to do this with spectra. We're going to look for oxygen and ozone and methane and water. We're going to look for CO2, although that's going to be, frankly, kind of hard. And we're going to look for, like, things like the red edge. I, I, I personally would be willing to put my name on a paper that said we found evidence of life on a planet around another star if we had this whole suite of gases. The hard thing becomes when you don't have the full suite that Earth has today, or if you start to think about looking for kinds of life that don't exist on Earth today. I mean, one of the questions I get from public, I got, actually got this from my mother-in-law, I've got it from fellow scientists, I've gotten from, from kids. That, <laughs> there's a common question I get when we talk about searching for life beyond Earth, it's like, well, you're talking about aliens, right? Have you thought outside the box? And are you ready for the weird stuff, right? So, yeah. You can ask, go ahead. Okay, okay keep going. Last slide. Yeah, so that's the red edge. So basically, if you look at the color of leaves, um, you see a big spike, and I think it is associated right around the color red. Um, and that's something that is indicative of plant life at the surface. Now, there are potential false positives, like minerals that could give a similar kind of feature. Um, but if you, I, and I, I want to be careful here, I wouldn't count on a lot of the red edge type stuff to be a primary biosignature. But if I saw that red edge in the context of a planet that also had oxygen and methane and water, it would increase my confidence that there was life on the planet. Because I'd also see some photos, well, something that was consistent with photosynthetic activity at the surface inside the context of a planet for which I saw the byproducts of oxygenic photosynthesis in the same planet at the same time. So again, looking to Earth history gives us a guide on how to start thinking outside the box. Um, if, you, if you think about the amount of oxygen we have on Earth today, uh, it's a lot and it's detectable. But if you go backwards in time, even 500 million years, the amount of oxygen may have been undetectable. Fortunately, ozone, which is a photochemical byproduct of oxygen in the atmosphere, would have been detectable for that, that, that time period. 
all the way back to about two and a half billion years ago. Past that, you get into the Archean and oxygen levels were so low that ozone and oxygen both would have been undetectable, which, which begs a question, right? And we were talking about this earlier today. The origin of life wasn't two and a half billion years ago, right? It was at least a billion years before that, if not longer uh, before that in Earth's history. So if we're missing a billion years out of Earth's history of life, how, you know, what, what are we doing here, right? Like we're gonna build an expensive telescope and miss a third of the history of life on Earth if we were, if we were staring back at home? Uh, that I'm not comfortable with that. So what we, what, and this is, this is part of what is important about astrobiology, not just thinking about the instruments and the missions, but also thinking about the fundamental science that goes into what is a biosignature and what are the, the full range of biosignatures we might expect. So this is work that mostly follows from my colleague and office mate Chada Arni, who's been thinking about what signatures that anoxic, that oxygen-free atmosphere would, would present. And what she's found is a couple things. One is there was a lot more methane. So as those oxygen and ozone features are getting less strong, the methane features are getting more strong, uh, which means you can see the methane, which is good. The problem is that methane has a lot of uh, ways to be produced without biology, um, and that's, that's bad. Um, for example, Titan in our own solar system has plenty of methane in its atmosphere. Now what, what Jod has proposed in the literature, and I think she's onto something here, is that if you have a haze and you, you see that methane, you might, you might have a biosignature. Now, the problem with that is Titan also has a haze. So how do you distinguish between a biological planet that has a haze and methane and something like Titan where there's a haze and methane but no life? And the key is, is not just looking at the one thing that's a biosignature, right? Like, like the haze and the methane on their own are not biosignatures. What is a biosignature is the haze and the methane in the environmental context of a planet that is A, in the habitable zone and is bombarded with light and UV radiation all the time and has lots of oxygen atoms in its atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide and critically of water. Because if you've got CO2 and water in the atmosphere, there's gonna be a photochemical network that works to destroy the haze and the methane. And the only way you keep the methane and the haze in the atmosphere is if you're making the methane at the surface super rapidly. And orders of magnitude more rapidly than non-biological, th than we think non-biological processes can produce methane. Right, so this isn't a factor two problem. It's not even a factor of 10 problem. This is like a three to four orders of magnitude problem between the, the, the abiotic production rates of methane we think you can have on a planet versus what it takes to maintain a, a, a haze and methane in an atmosphere where you've got carbon dioxide and water and UV light. Now, what's important about that is that you, that means you can't just look for the haze and the methane. Your mission has to be able to detect that other stuff too. You have to see the water, you have to see the carbon dioxide, and you have to see the UV light from the host star. And all that has to be well characterized before you can even start to talk about a biosignature. Now it's, what's interesting is as we've thought about our, our modern Earth and Proterozoic Earth, which, which we'd be looking for oxygen in, we're starting to tell a similar story. Because in the last uh, eight years, we've started to think about ways that non-biological processes could also make oxygen at, uh, uh, I shouldn't say make oxygen, I should say accumulate oxygen in a, in a planetary atmosphere. And the way you do that is you, like I use a bathtub analogy, like this is kind of gross, but like it's true. If you never clean your bathtub, right, eventually like the drain's gonna get clogged and then like you're gonna take a shower one day and like the water's gonna like start coming up like to your ankles and it's gonna be all gross and then you like, you clear the drain and then like the water drains out and you're good, right? What's happening there is whatever's in blocking the drain is slowing the rate at which water leaves the bathtub. And so if you've got the sort of the same input of water, but a slower output, it's gonna to come to like a greater concentration or level in the bathtub at steady state. We found ways to basically do the same thing for abiotic planets. We found ways to basically really slow down the destruction of oxygen. And so even if you're making it slowly with non-biological processes, you can accumulate it in an atmosphere just like water accumulating in a clogged up tub. So, the, and the important thing about that, it's just like the Archean Earth story. What you want to look for are the telltale signs that the oxygen destruction is slow. And that comes in the form of chemical context. Uh, and we've been worried about this because we don't, what I don't want to do, <laughs> I don't want to spend, because this telescope, by the way, it's not going to launch till at the earliest 2035 and more likely 2040. I want to be on that team. That's a long time from now. And I want to retire someday. I don't want to spend my whole career and lots of taxpayer money to find evidence of life and call the president and tell her we found it and then be wrong in the literature like a year later, okay? Like that's not, there's parts of that world that, that sound good to me, but the part where we're wrong after spending my life and a lot of other people's lives on the mission, I don't like. Um, 
And so we've been thinking about this a lot, and we've, what we've been doing is actually cataloging all the ways that you can make oxygen in a planetary uh, atmosphere that don't involve production of oxygen at the surface by biology. Um, and we've been thinking one step past that, which are what are the observational features that those abiotic production mechanisms would have, and what are the features that are unique to the, to the planets for which the oxygen is coming from biological processes. And, and the moral of this story is basically you want the same thing. You want to get at how fast is the oxygen being destroyed. And if you see things like methane and water in, in, the, in the planetary atmosphere, you know the oxygen is going to be destroyed rapidly um, and, and that you need to replenish it rapidly to keep it uh, in the planetary atmosphere. And again, this is an orders of magnitude problem. The, the oxygen production rates that we can accumulate oxygen with here are orders of magnitude slower than modern day oxygen production rates, right? Not 10 like not a factor 10, not a factor two, multiple orders of magnitude. Okay, now all this leads to something that you don't have to read, but basically all that science I was just talking about actually gets folded. This, this is a figure from, our, uh, from the Louvoir interim report, which is gonna get released to the public in about a month. We have, we have thought carefully about a series of observations we would make that would both optimize our telescope time, but also rigorously assess the chemical context of a planet and its stellar context in terms of the UV radiation hitting the top of the atmosphere. Okay, now Louvar wouldn't just stop there. Just like with the diversity of worlds, we're gonna do this, this kind of science in our solar system as well. Okay, so our nearest, one of our nearest neighbors, one of our two nearest neighbors, Mars, um, has a controversial detection of methane that, that some say vary on seasonal and spatial time scales. We're measuring it at the surface with, with a rover. There's two different orbiters from two different countries, uh, one from ESA, one from India, that are looking at methane from orbit. Um, and we're looking for at methane with ground-based telescopes. Louvoir would help tell that story because it's gonna be able to get global images of the methane on Mars. This is just a model uh, of like methane diffusing from a, a point source or a plume on the surface. But if there was a plume of methane on the surface, imagine you have a rover there, you've got an orbiter passing overhead that's getting a really detailed look across one swath of, 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 you know, that, that, uh, of the plume and you're, you're able to put that plume in a global context. Because Louvoir would be able to not just make global high resolution maps of the Martian surface, but also map out things like methane and carbon monoxide and other trace gases in the Martian atmosphere. And our friends on Europa, so uh, habitable zone is a, is a term that exoplanet folks throw around uh, loosely and probably inaccurately, but it's the term we're dealt with. We don't think Europa is dead. Um, we actually think it quite, has quite a lot of potential for life, and we actually want to be a part of the story of, of what we might be doing in and around Europa um, in a few ways. For one, there's a Europa Clipper mission that's being planned, uh, and also potential Europa lander. We want to help sort of serve as like a long-term reconnaissance for those missions. Imagine the Clipper is like flying around Europa, and it wants to fly into a plume that's coming, that's like kind of spewing water from the subsurface of Europa out into space. Well, what Louvoir can do is the same thing Hubble did. Hubble found those plumes, right, with UV observations that saw the hydrogen and oxygen coming up from the surface. We could do that, but we could do it at much higher resolution. And we can tell the clipper, hey, <laughs> the plume's there. If you want to fly through it and catch a little bit, little bit of that plume, that's where you want to fly. We can, tell, we can do long-term observations and see if, the, if these plumes repeatedly crop up at the same point on the surface, which might help with landing site selection for a Europa lander. Okay, so that's everything we did, um, everything I just talked about is kind of like where we start when we think about spaceflight missions at NASA. We start with the science. We start with goals of, of, that we want to achieve and realize, and then we get with the engineers and we find out what is it gonna take to make this all possible. Okay, so the rest of this is gonna be sort of like what is it gonna take to do all that science I just talked about. And the, the quote here that I think is most relevant um, is one from Amelia Earhart, Earhart, which is the most effective way to do it is to do it. And this is important in two ways. One, sometimes you just have to decide that you're gonna be ambitious enough to try something really hard, even if it's really hard. The second is the things that we are most capable of doing are the things that we already know how to do because we've done them before. And it's important that when we're doing really hard things, we leverage as much of our, our what we call heritage, but our, our expertise and history as possible. Okay, so this is not a mistake. There's a pale blue dot on the screen, and it's on here to show you the most difficult technical problem our engineers have to deal with. Can anyone see it? I'd, I'd be shocked if you could. I actually, I'm wearing glasses, and I'm right next to the screen, and I, I literally can't see it, but I promise you it's on there. Now, can anyone see it now? In the back, can you see it in the back? Probably not. 
So you can't, okay. So it's right, if you can't see it, it's right there. And it was right there all along, okay? Now there's two problems that I just demonstrated, right? It, it went from like impossible to see to really hard to see. The impossible to see part of it, back here, is that little pale blue dot, even though it's there, you can't detect it with your eyes because they're literally kind of like flooded and overwhelmed with light from the rest of the screen. And that light is running up right next to that pale blue dot. It's kind of like if you're trying to track a ball or a plane in the sky and it's crossing right over the sun. If you keep watching it, you'll go blind. <laughs> Don't do that. Or at least you'll, you'll, you'll uh, suffer some pain in your eyeballs for, for a little bit. Um, and the reason is that the sunlight is overwhelming your detectors. And the same thing's happening here. The light from the screen is overwhelming your detectors to the point where they can't detect the pale blue dot somewhere in this field. The second problem is the pale blue dot is pale. It's really dim. Um, and so you need, you need to be able to collect photons from that really dim thing uh, to be able to uh, analyze it, especially if you want to not just see the pale blue dot, but see how blue it is, um, which means you have to not just collect light from it, but collect enough light to spread that light out into those different color buckets that give you the spectrum and do that with enough signal to noise to make some scientific measurements and assessments. That's, all of that is hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, fortunately, it's not a unicorn. It's not something we've never done before. In fact, we're doing it right now, just not quite at the level we need to do it for how, uh, rocky planets and the habitable zones of other stars. All right, so these are, this is real imagery that's been stitched together to make a movie. This is from ground-based observations. I want to say a calamar, but I can't remember for sure which ground-based telescope it's from. This is not of potentially Earth-like worlds. This is of like really hot Jupiter-like things that are far out from, from their host star. But it's using the same technology that we need to, to use to find uh, rocky planets closer to the star that could have life. Okay. The difference is twofold. One, this is being done from the ground, so you're, you're kind of staring through the, the same atmosphere that make, makes the stars twinkle at night and, and, and screws with our astronomical observations. And the second is it's just not at the level of technology we need it to be yet in terms of how effective it is at blocking out that central starlight. And the way this works is like, you know, it, it's like as, almost as dumb as you might think. Like if you were tracking a ball in the sky or a plane in the sky and you put your hand over the sun, that's kind of what it's doing. <laughs> just in like no way more complicated way than that. Okay, uh, so that's one challenge. Keep that in mind. Uh, we're developing technologies that, that will help us solve it. One of the things we need to do is we need to big build the larger telescopes. That's, and I talked about this at the outset. That's going to give us better angular resolution, more spatial pixels. It's going to let us see those pale blue dots and see enough light from them to, to get spectra on them. Um, and it turns out that it's easier to block out the starlight with the larger telescope as well, for reasons that have to do with the physics of how you, how you block that central starlight. So for, I'm just going to put this down. Well, let's see. I, no, I can do this. All right. So for example, Hubble is 2.4 meters across. It's like probably a little bit bigger than my wingspan, okay? So Hubble's got a mirror that's about yay big around, okay? JWST, Mike, I'm gonna walk so my levels might spike for a second, I apologize, is six and a half meters across, so uh, it's probably about the, the, probably about the width of this stage is six and a half meters across, and that, that's the difference between what JWST is gonna see in the universe and Hubble, it's, it's going to have much better spatial resolution. It's also looking in the infrared, and it's going to be able to see really faint stuff that's, that's redshifted so far. We have to look in the infrared to see that stuff. Louvoir is, is a factor of over two, again, bigger than that. So I couldn't even block this out. It's probably about from here to the edge of that room. The, the edge of the room is about how big across the Louvoir primary mirror would be. Now that brings, and by the way, this isn't something we assemble in space. Just like JWST, we'd fold this up in a rocket. And by the way, yes, every time SpaceX or Blue Origin or NASA launches a new powerful rocket, like the scientists are cheering, because that means like more mass and more volume to space. We get like super excited about it. Um, so we could, we've found out we can fold this thing up into uh, SLS, which is basically like NASA's version of the Falcon Heavy. It's the next generation rocket NASA's building to send humans to Mars and other locations. For us, it's the thing we stuff giant space telescopes into. Um, now, not only does the mirror have to be big, the other challenge with it is it has to be super stable. It has to be stable on the level of like tens of picometers um, and be that large. And we're developing the technologies for that too, and I'll show a picture or two of that uh, at the end. And it's going to stow in the rocket and then unfold in space. Um, this is not the current design. We've actually changed our mirror design. It's closer to the, what I showed on the last image. Um, it's going to have two folds on either side, unlike Webb, which has one on either side. And it's got this central baffle to prevent stray light from getting in from other targets like the moon or, or other stars that we're not looking at. 
It's going to have a sun shield. We've had problems with the sun shield on JWST. This one's the size of a football field. Yes, it makes me nervous. Um, and it's going to have, below the telescope or behind it, it's going to have instruments. It'll have four instrument bays. Um, one difference between Louvoir and JWST that's important, other than the differences I've mentioned so far, is our, Louv our, our instrument bays for Louvoir will be serviceable. So they're going to have all the knobs that astronauts or robots need to, to uh, grab onto them, swap them out, and put a next generation instrument in. Or if we mess something up with the telescope, put in an instrument that has corrective optics, which is how we fixed Hubble. Now all this, and this goes back to the quote from, from Amelia Earhart, all of this leverages the stuff we've already done, right? We know how to build these segmented telescopes. We're about to launch one, I promise. We're going to launch it soon <laughs> uh, with JWST. And that's a huge technology that's going into Louvoir, but it's not the only one. WFIRST, which is the next flagship mission after JWST, is helping develop the coronagraph technology and demonstrate how it would work in space, almost to the level we need it to work for Louvoir. We're learning a lot of science from Kepler about these exoplanets I talked about before, and we're going to learn that from TESS, which is also launching later this year, that's going to be kind of like a Kepler on steroids. And from Hubble, we've learned, uh, first of all, just a tremendous about, amount about the universe, but secondly, how to operate UV optical infrared telescopes like Louvoir and operate them for, for many decades. Um, a lot of people have said, like, if you really want to know what Louvoir is, it's the super duper duper Hubble, right? Like, it's Hubble, but like souped up in like a thousand different ways. Uh, I should mention before I close, um, there's there's one other telescope that's being concept that's being studied alongside Louvoir. So Louvoir, and by the way, Louvoir is not like for sure happening. I don't want to give that impression to this this audience. Louvoir is a concept mission that's basically being pitched to the, the National Academy's Astrophysics uh, Decadal Survey for Sciences, right? And the Decadal Survey will make a prioritization as to whether Louvoir or something else should go forward as like the next flagship mission for NASA. But it's one of four concepts that are being pitched. Louvoir, the Origin Space Telescope, which is going to do science similar to Webb, but with a, a, a more sensitive uh, uh, set of instruments because it's going to be even colder than, than JWST is. Lynx, which is an X-ray telescope that'll look at high energy processes in the universe. And Habex is the fourth. And this is an, an artist's rendering of Habex. Habex is a lot like Louvoir, but on a, a less ambitious scale, but with maybe like some smaller technological challenges, right? And, and this is important because uh, what's the quote? Like the future is, 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 is hard to predict, right? Um, especially because it hasn't happened yet. Um, we don't know what our budgets are going to be like next year. We definitely don't know what our budgets are going to be in five or ten years. We don't know what technologies that we're trying to develop, develop now are actually going to be ready when this new mission starts in five years. It's important for us to like, study an array of different options because we want to be ready for that sort of diversity of future possibilities. Um, and Habex is a huge part of that. So like, there's Habex, there's Louvoir. They're doing the same kind of science on different scales with different levels of challenge in front of them in terms of technology and cost. Um, and we've even talked, like, joked internally about like a Luvax, which is like maybe a sweet spot in between. OK, so lastly, what are our hurdles beyond like the technical challenges? Um, so <laughs> and I love this quote from the senior scientist for astrobiology, and I think that's on display today. Everyone's an astrobiologist. They just don't know it yet, right? Because this is an all hands on deck problem in every way imaginable. We need instrument designers and engineers to figure out how to block the central starlight. This is some maps of what that looks like as the sort of as the telescope instrumentation sees it. This is actually pictures of the technology that would give us that picometer stability. So, and that's like a whole different kind of engineering than like the, because this is like a systems engineering problem. This is, you need all different kinds of engineers like mechanical, optical, thermal, uh, electrical, all on board this problem. And that, that in and of itself is an interdisciplinary problem. But we also need to think as scientists about the diversity of ways that we could assess the data that we're going to get. And actually, I think the person that's pushed this stuff forward is someone that, that spent some time here, which is Sarah Walker, who's been talking a lot about agnostic biosignatures and networks of chemicals as a biosignature on Europa and Enceladus. But she's also started to think about the same thing for exoplanets, right? So instead of looking at just like the oxygen, methane, water trio, maybe using what we can see to infer the chemical, the, the, the complexity of the chemical network that's underneath in that planetary atmosphere and trying to use that as sort of our, our assessment of whether or not there's, there's life on a particular planet, um, which I, I think there's a tremendous amount of merit here, but there's a lot of research that has yet to be done. Um, so, but the point here is we need all hands on deck. We need people like Sarah Walker. We need people like in this room that have thought a lot about chemical networks um, to start thinking about what would a biosignature look like from a chemical network perspective instead of the perspective I traditionally look at it, which is like two or three individual molecules, which together are hard to keep in an atmosphere. The, the, the network approach is a, a more quantifiable way to say what I just said. Okay, and then lastly, 
we need diversity in terms of the disciplines we bring to bear, but like there's a lot of research that's shown that like more diverse teams, not just in terms of discipline, but in terms of race and gender and just socioeconomic background, like when you've got more diverse teams, you get to better answers faster. And to be frank, we just we don't have a diverse enough community to for me to be comfortable to say that like we were really optimized in that sense. Um, and so this is the last quote, and it's the one I'm going to leave you all with, which is, it's time for parents to teach young people early on that in diversity there is beauty and there is strength. I think that's true about the universe. I think that's true about teams that try to tackle hard problems. And I thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. Thanks. So, are the, do you, where's Kenda? Do you want to do questions, Kenda? Where is Kenda? Yeah, sure. Yeah, man. What kind of resolution are you getting with the uh, spectrometers on Livewire? Uh, spectral resolution? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, they're a little bad. Sorry. Well, uh, I didn't go into the instruments in detail. Um, I'm going to try to do this from memory, but it, I'm probably not going to hit it all. Are you, are you ask, can I ask what target you're asking about? Is it an exoplanet or a solar system target? For the spectra. For the exoplanet spectra that I was showing. OK. For the exoplanet spectra, we're looking at a target resolution of 150, um, because that's what we need to see the oxygen uh, A band really, really well. Um, there are I ideas and concepts to go super high resolution, like into the hundreds or the thousands. Um, the problem with that is unless we have super low noise detectors, we're, we're breaking up the photons into so many bins, we're getting hit by the, 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 the detector noise. Um, so we, the, the game we want to play is we want to go uh, high enough resolution to observe the bands we're looking for from oxygen, but not the molecular lines, the, the, the band structure. Um, but not so high that we're losing to the noise of the, of the, of, from the binning. Um, and 150 looks like a sweet spot in terms of optimizing your observation time for oxygen. Um, so, and because that's so central to a lot of what we're doing, we've kind of hit it there. At that resolution, we also see water and methane and other things in that wavelength range. We have a higher resolution mode of, I think, 200 in the concept instrument out in the infrared. Um, that's specifically to see carbon dioxide in very CO2 rich atmospheres. And the reason for that is that's one of the false positive mechanisms I mentioned before. If you've got a lot of CO2, you can photolyze it and make O2 and O3 without life. And so, but you can only do it if there's a ton of CO2. So if you've got like 3% of your atmosphere is CO2, which is way more than what we have, um, then you'd be able to see CO2 in the infrared, but only at a spectral resolution of 200. And that's what we've got in the infrared, one mode that's at that high. Does that answer your question? And we've got like three or four other spectro uh, spectrographs on board, like the high, defini high definition imager has got like a wide field camera with a spectrograph. I honestly don't remember <laughs> what the spectral resolution is, but if ever, anyone wants to know, I can show details on those concepts later. That was a hard question. Thanks. <laughs> Other questions? Do right, you want to throw it to you? Ready? You. I've been having bad luck with this. Um, I had a question about, well, you mentioned four concepts but you chose to speak to us about Lavoir, and I was just wondering why that was. Like, what, what makes this your pet project, I guess? Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, uh, I'm on two of the four teams. I'm on the Lavoir team, I'm on the Habex team. It's hard to explain this, right, and not, and not like short sell Habex, right? So Habex is literally the mission. It's like a, a different brand and, a, and an update to a mission that when I was a graduate student, it was like my life's ambition to be a part of. Like that mission at that point was called TPFC, the, TP, uh, the Terrestrial Planet Finder Chronograph Mission. Um, Habex is basically that, right? So if Habex happened, like, and I was part of that, I would be fulfilling my like grad student dream at that point. Um, Louvoir is like that, but like, times 10, literally. Like we'd get like 10 times more planets, 10 times more spectra. Uh, and, and an important part to this is the astronomer community, like the general astrophysics community, they really want the big telescope. So as a, an exoplanet person, 
we haven't had like Hubble class science, like a, a mission that could directly image exoplanets from space. We, we haven't had that yet. The astronomers have had Hubble, which does a lot of great space astronomy already. So for them, going a little bit beyond Hubble isn't as worth it as it would be for me, like in terms of telescope size. So for the, the general astrophysics community, the first third of that talk, they really want to get to a telescope that's like eight meters or bigger. That's kind of their, their benchmark. And the other two missions, they would do some exoplanet stuff. OST would do some biosignature stuff. Lynx would look at like atmospheric escape. But neither one would do the biosignature job that Louvoir or HabEx would do. Other questions? We good? And I'll be, oh, in the back. Um, I need a shortstop. I need a relay person. All right. Uh, what was the idea behind the choice of the gases that you monitor? For example, you exclude sulfur compounds, which will be transitory, but they give you a lot of information about things that happen. <laughs> you know what's hard is like I'm literally like I was talking about like getting blinded by the sun. It's like hard catching this because like the floodlights are like right in my eyes. Um, so the question was about like what about sulfur gases? I love sulfur gases. Um, well, I'm a modeler. <laughs> I don't. I, when I was a grad student, the lab next to me like was growing microbes that make sulfur gases, and I didn't love sulfur gases then. Um, I would just like take off for the afternoon when they were like doing the experiments because they. For those that like are on the internet and aren't scientists, like they smell horrible. Most horrible smells are like sulfur gases, but uh, they're made by life, right? So why should we look at the sulfur gases as well? We actually looked at this. Um, it was back for a different telescope called TPFI, the Terrestrial Planet Finder Interferometer. Um, we we ran our model where we basically took the modern day production rates of uh, organic sulfur gases like uh, methyl sulfide and dimethyl sulfide and dimethyl disulfide and uh, carbonyl sulfide, I think. I can't remember the full list of them. Um, but we had like five or six uh, uh, biologically produced sulfur gases. Most of them had a methyl group and a sulfur in some combination. Uh, and we tried to see if we could, at what rates we'd have to produce them in order for them to be detectable. It turns out that you have to get like orders of more, uh, orders more production out of the biosphere than we have on modern day Earth um, before they grow up to detectable levels themselves. Now, that could happen, like uh, you know, like if you go in the lab and you give some methanogens H2S from the headspace instead of H2, they can actually make CH3SH instead of methane. So I, I, I could imagine, um, as a modeler, an atmosphere that might uh, induce some microbes to like make a lot of methyl sulfide, for example. Um, however, if you don't want to count on that kind of specific, like fine-tuned answer, um, what you do get is even in the cases where you are not um, seeing the CH3SH or the other organic sulfur gases, the reason you're not seeing them is the, the methyl sulfur, sulfur bond is actually much easier to, to break than the, the, the methyl hydrogen bond in methane. And as a result, if you put the same amount of methyl uh, uh, of CH3 into the atmosphere, uh, with a biosphere versus from non-biological processes, because the organic sulfur gases, which are easier to break up and turn into CH3 radicals, um, because, th because they're easier to do that with, you end up making more ethane in the atmosphere than you do for the non-biological case. And so what ended up happening is if we put the same amount of CH3 in, but it was distributed between methane and these organic sulfur gases, we got a much higher ethane to methane ratio in the atmosphere. And that work I showed for the organic haze, when we went back and looked at the haze, the haze also got thicker because that's a, that's a long chain organic carbon. And that was easier to build up once you're, you're sort of liberating the CH3 from the sulfur. Um, so we have looked at it. It's really hard for those to be directly detectable, but they may have sort of a secondary influence on some of the other biosignatures we've been looking at. Okay, question? Okay. Uh, all right. So if we do find life in the suite of things we mentioned, uh, then what? Um, I retire. Um, so, but seriously, I, I, you know, I think one of the things that would happen is, and I, I think back like to the Allen Hills meteorite or any any detection of life beyond Earth. What, what's going to happen is a whole bunch of smart people are going to find a way to make the signal we find without life. Like, it's not that I don't think that our like stories like lock solid. Like, I really believe in our story, 
But some genius is going to like figure out some corner case pathological way to like reproduce the data without biology making it. Like it's just going to happen. Um, but what we have, I mean, but this is what the scientific method is about. What we have to do is make sure that that method that makes the signal without life has a predictable, observable feature, right? And there's follow-up missions we could do. One of them is is to to do an interferometer, which would also get the pictures of the planet. It would get spectra in the infrared, which would get a complementary set of of gases, including a lot of the sulfur gases that that Olga just asked about. Um, it would also get uh, information on the thermal properties of the planet and its climate and stuff like that. You get complementary information. Another idea is you could build an interferometer of visible, of basically a fleet of Louvoirs acting as an interferometer would be able to let you like map out the surface and like maybe even see, like when I say map out, like get pixels across the surface and maybe like see a, a, like a rainforest or an algal bloom. Um, that would be pretty hard to explain. <laughs> if you had oxygen and methane and you saw like seasonal blooms of like chlorophyll. Uh, then, then my kid retires. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, what makes it, this actually goes back to the first question, what makes this so exciting is there's two things that, that Louvar in particular get me really like jazzed up about. With, even with regards to HabX, which I like love and would be like super stoked if it happened. One is, I want to start asking, it goes back to like the exoplanet stuff I was talking about, like we've, rewritten our models of how planets evolve and interact gravitationally. And we know better how our home system has evolved as a result. I want to do the same kind of science for how a biosphere interacts with its host planet on a number of targets beyond the solar system. Right? Whether there's life there or not, even if we find no biosignatures, or even if we find a few biosignatures, understanding the planetary environments in which we do and do not find them, in cases where we otherwise would expect them to be, and probing that to greater detail, is going to teach us a tremendous amount of planetary science and Earth system science. And I'm looking forward to that. Like, that's, that's what I want to see, right? Um, and then the other aspect to it is, and this is like where the retirement joke comes in. Like, my, my general, I don't know how many people in the room, like, remember Apollo, like, 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 like saw it on TV. Like, I didn't, right? Like, m my generation, we don't have an Apollo, like, landing moment, right? And, and the reason Apollo was, a, like, so amazing is, like, it's the first time that ever happened. Right? And whether it's exoplanets, or whether it's Europa, or Mars, or Enceladus, or Titan, or some other target, or you know, some, some say Venus, although I'm not too optimistic there. The first time we find, like there's only one time in human history that we find life beyond Earth for the first time. Right? Like that, that's going to happen once, and that's going to be it, and we'll all remember it. Right? So in some sense, like after, like th that's where the retirement joke comes in, right? Because then I'm good. Like we've made history. I'm good like chilling out after that. <laughs> That it? All right, I'm gonna hang out. So other questions, come up to me with a beer or something. All right. Thank you, everybody. Let's get it. Thank you. Thank you, John.